Hare Krishna. So this morning, the verse gives us a fascinating glimpse into the psychology of God, into how God thinks. So we see the psychology of how children think also. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll speak this talk class in three parts. First I'll talk about how everyone, even atheists, are trying to understand the mind of God. Second, I talk about how scripture reveals to us the mind of God and how lastly I'll talk about how that applies in our day to day life as we face life's challenges. So Stephen Hawking was considered to be one of the greatest physicists of the recent times he passed away a few years ago. And in one of his earlier books, which is considered to the considered to be among the world's most unread bestseller. <laughs> many, many people bought it because it was considered intellectually glamorous to buy that book, but very few people actually read that book. So anyway, that book was called The Brief History of Time. And one of the last sentences he wrote is that he says science is searching for an equation that can explain everything, what he called as the gut, the grand unified theory. And he says, if we get that theory, then we will know the mind of God. Now, of course, he kept that open ended, what, what, what he meant by the word God, he did not, he did not use God hardly any time in his book throughout, but at the end he used it. Then he let, later on read a book called The Grand Design where he tried to overturn the arguments of Thies by saying that the universe is so grand that it is a design without a designer. That is the grandness of the design. Of course, his uh, book was, second book was of course filled with many logical fallacies. Uh, for example, he says that because the laws of nature exist, so the universe can create itself from nothing. Now, it's probably more difficult to it's it's difficult to find one sentence with as many logical problems as this one sentence because the laws of nature exist now why do they exist yesterday's class i was talking about how the laws of nature their existence is foundational to science but explaining their existence is extremely problematic for science but even if the laws of nature exist the laws of nature don't explain anything they simply explain, they simply tell us how causes and effects will correlate. Say for example, if I ask you, okay, how much money do you have? You say, I've got $20 and I give you $30. How much money will you have? $50. Okay. Now, if I ask you, okay, how much is 20 plus 30? You'll say 50. Now, does 20 plus 30 equal to 50 lead to 50 dollars in your pocket? The laws of nature do not cause anything to happen. When the causes are present, then how the causes will produce an effect, the laws of nature tell that. Anyway, the point I'm making here is that even a physicist like him, he was trying to understand the mind of God. So, what he, when he was an atheist, what did he mean by the mind of God? He meant the pattern by which things happen in the world. How do things work out? So, scientists try to think of the universe as a machine. That is one of the prevailing dogmas of mainstream science. That the universe is like a machine. And a prominent athe atheist said that we are all like lumbering robots. And our mind is like a computer. So basically the whole idea is that we are machines and the universe is like a big machine. And if you understand how a particular program works, what is the programming by which a particular machine is working, 
then we will understand everything. So, why do we want to understand the mind of God or to put it in a more uh, generic sense, why do we want to understand how things work? Because we have to live in the world and if we understand how the world works, then we can make it work for our benefit, work to fulfill our ends. So, right now if you understand how this gadget works, then we can make it work in a way that it will serve the purpose we want it to serve. If we do not know how the gadget works and we are trying to figure it out and fiddle with it, we may not be able to get it done. So, just as we need to understand how a gadget works to make it work, similarly we want to understand the nature of reality by which we can live in a way that is joyful and successful. So, in that sense everybody is trying to understand the mind of God and actually even atheists love to serve God, but they love to serve God only in one role, that role is as an advisor. They want to tell God, hey, you should not have done like this. They look at the design in nature and they say, this is faulty, this should not be like this, this should not be faulty. So, and their God normally is non-existent, but whenever the atheists want to give advice, that God pops into existence, gratefully accepts their advice and then pops back into non-existence. <laughs> so, everybody in, to some extent is trying to understand the nature of reality. And if we consider God as the being who is in charge of reality, understanding the mind of God means understanding how reality works. So, we are all trying to understand, okay, if I do this, what will happen? If I do this, what will happen? Now, what will happen means, what I do alone does not determine the result. If I do A, B will happen and then if A plus B will lead to C and C is what I want to happen. So, we all live in a world which is very, which is very reciprocal that I do something and something happens. So, we are trying to understand the nature of reality by which we can make things happen the way we want, the purpose we want to serve. So, for example, I am speaking right now. So, I want to convey a message. So, while I am speaking, I am trying to, I am observing you know, is what I am speaking understandable or not or is it becoming too complicated. Sometimes when I am giving a class and suddenly the audience starts looking at me as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles. <laughs> then I start understanding that oh, probably I am speaking too abstract or too fast or whatever. So, we all want to understand, we all want to do things in life and for that we need to understand the nature of reality. So, in that sense, everyone is trying to understand the mind of God, even people who do not believe in God. So, when we are trying to understand the nature of reality, so we all have certain underlying conceptions of the nature of reality based on which we try to understand it. So, science has the idea that nature, okay, can we fix this from somewhere? I would like to, to be like this only. No, I want it to be. Okay, thank you. So, now sci for science, the underlying metaphor is that the universe is like a machine. This is a presumption. There is no necessary proof that all of reality is mechanical. But that is the underlying presumption with which science works. Now, within the broad Vedic tradition, also. There is the idea that nature is mechanical, but reality is not mechanical. Nature means material nature in many ways works in mechanical ways, but all of reality is not mechanical. And that is indicate the idea is we can have broadly two, two conceptions mechanical and personal. So, say for example, if, a if somebody, if a plane is flying through the sky, then the plane is a machine and it operates according to mechanical principles, but behind that there is a person. Now, the operation of the machine of the plane depends on both the mechanical structure of the machine of the plane as well as the personal expertise of the pilot. So, the scientific metaphor is that the machine is all that there is. And if you can understand the laws by which the machine is functioning, then we are successful. We do not need anything more after that. 
But the scripture tells us, the scriptures tell us that there is something more than the machine. We don't deny the reality of the machine. Maya dhyakshena prakriti suyate sacharacharam. Hetu nane na kaunteya jagad viparivartate. 9.10 Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that material nature has its own laws. And it works according to those. But those laws are under my supervision. So, there is a personal agent behind the laws of nature. And in this particular pastime, the personal, the emotions of that personal being are being talked about. So, the first point I said is, everybody is trying to understand the mind of God, the nature of reality. And second point is, what scripture reveals to us about the mind of God. So, in for, let's see what is happening in this pastime. So, there is this demon Hiranyaksha and he has exploited the earth and extracted outrageous amounts of gold from it. And because of that, the earth has lost its cosmic balance and has fallen into the cosmic ocean and sunk over there. And the Lord has now brought the earth out and he has kept it on the water and it's floating there. And he has invested his potency, that was yesterday's verse, by which it is floating. And now he is going to, turn, is, that all this time this demon, Varaha, is, has got a big mace and is yelling at the Lord, he is screaming abusive words. Now what does this pastime mean? See, one of the biggest discoveries, or you could say, some discoveries are pleasant, some are unpleasant. So, one of the unpleasant discoveries of science is that nature is far more complicated than what we think it to be. So, that's why we are having enormous amount of ecological problems. Because scientists thought that, not scientists, in general materialists thought that we could exploit this and gain this, we could exploit this and gain this. But nature has huge amount of subtle balances. And what disturbing, what will cause, what disturbance, where we can't know. So, he's, Hiranyak simply extracted gold and because of that, the earth lost its cosmic balance. So, beyond the specifics of what happened, it illustrates the principle that when we tamper with nature, what will set what off, we don't know. Like sometimes we use a complicated device and we try to monkey around with it. And we press one button and suddenly a fire starts. And then within a few minutes the whole device is on fire. And then the whole house is on fire. And then we panic what to do. So, Hiranya Aksha has a very reductive view of reality. How this earth is simply a source of gold for me and I want gold. I did not see the earth beyond that at all. So, because of this reductive view of reality, he exploited the earth and there was disruption. And whenever there is disruption, the Lord intervenes to create order once again. There is always some level of disorder in the world. Just like we can say in every country there are criminals. And not all criminals are in the jail. You could say that all criminals should be in the jail, but there are different levels of wrongdoings. And uh, when crime becomes extremely high, there are different, different kinds of crimes, small, small thefts that might not lead to very serious punishment. Sometimes, okay, you made this mistake, forgive it, overlook it. So, what happens is, when the, when the crime rises beyond a particular level, then the government just becomes extremely active. Just like in recently in Christchurch, there was this terrible shooting, then the whole country became alarmed and security has been beefed up and so many things happened because of that. So, there is a normal level of disorderliness and there is an abnormal level of disorderliness. So, there is uh, normally some level of adharma is always there in the world. Disorderliness is there, but that the Lord lets people deal with it themselves. But when the disorderliness becomes too much, then the Lord intervenes. And similarly in Kali Yuga, this is, we say it's three yugi, the law, one of the names of Vishnu is three yugi. Now, three yugi has two different meanings. One is that he comes only in three yugas. And if Kali Yuga is the darkest of age, that is where we might say he is needed the most. 
then why wouldn't he come in Kali Yuga? So one way of looking at it is that, say in some cities, like say Chicago or some other cities, where the, there are certain areas in Mumbai, some parts, where actually the gangs rule, the mafia rules. And if you go there and you are robbed, and then you go to the police and complain, the police will say, why did you go there? Even we don't go there. <laughs> so it's like the police uh, have also abandoned that area. So one understanding of Kali Yuga is that, just like in the area where the gang rules, everybody is a part of the criminal zone. So then the police said, you take care of yourself, we will not intervene. So one understanding is Kali Yuga is like that, all the souls here are so disorderly that the Lord says, I won't intervene, you just do whatever you want. That's one understanding. But the other understanding is that he's Triyugi because in Kali Yuga when he comes, he comes as a manifestation that is not just there for some time, he's always there. That is as the holy name. So through the holy name, his manifest experience can be there always. Of course, another meaning also is that he comes as a Channa Avtar comes as a concealed incarnation. But anyway, the point is that when the disorderliness goes beyond a particular level, that's the time when the Lord descends. So one aspect of understanding the Lord's mind is that he has created a, a structure of reality and when that structure gets too disrupted, then he intervenes. So the earth sinking indicates that there is a cosm disorder of cosmic proportions. If there is a small fire in our house, we might extinguish it ourselves. But if there is a big fire, then we have to call the fire department. If there is a huge fire, if the local fire department cannot take handle it, then we have to call bigger fire tanks from maybe bigger cities or nearby places. So similarly, when there is a very big disaster, the Lord himself comes. So the problem has to be escalated to a higher and higher level. So the Lord has descended over here now. And the first thing he does is, if you say Krishna is described in the Bhagavad Gita, what is his purpose? Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadushkritam dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So he says that he protects the devotees, he destroys the demons and he restores dharma. So broadly speaking, he does this in that, this, that sequence. So here we see first thing in the previous verse it is described. Paritranaya sadhunam. He, the earth is afflicted, be, uh, fallen out of balance. So the, uh, the Lord has rescued the earth, the earth has come back, uh, earth is now back out of the ocean, and He has not yet placed the earth back in its normal place. But while it is on the ocean, He has infused it with mystical potency by which it can stay afloat. That means in emergency situations, the Lord can empower us to do extraordinary things. But those extraordinary powers are not our powers. I was just in America and I was talking with one senior Prabhupada disciple. Uh, he was a prominent leader in our movement earlier. So he said that when we would preach, maybe at that time, when Prabhupada was there and immediately after that, we would speak some sentences and people would be so inspired by that, people would be so transformed by that. Somehow if I speak the same thing now, it doesn't affect the people. So I was thinking, what happened? And he said, his realization is that when Prabhupada was there, Krishna empowered those who were serving Prabhupada to do things far more than what they normally could do. And that's why the Krishna consciousness movement was spread, not big, of course, the devotees were dedicated, incredibly dedicated, but along with that, Prabhupada, Krishna had empowered them to fulfill Prabhupada's desire. So, sometimes when we are able to do extraordinary things, it's easy to take credit for, oh, I did something extraordinary. But then the next day when we are not able to do it, then what happened? But if you understand that something bigger than me is acting through me, then we can do wonderful things and still maintain humility. If we consider, uh, uh, say the way people think today as compared to the way that people think, so thought 500 years ago, even in the western world, if somebody does something brilliantly, we say, you are a genius. But if we consider pre-enlightenment Europe, before the scientific revolution, there people, if somebody would write beautifully or somebody would paint beautifully, somebody would dance beautifully, they would say, you have genius within you. 
you have genius the word genius comes from the root where genius refer to some higher being that there is some higher being within you and that higher being is enabling you to do such extraordinary things so if the bhagavad gita krishna says that our abilities are gifts coming from him paurusham rishu says i am ability in human beings so to have ability uh, to have abilities to have uh, to have abilities is fortunate to know that we have abilities is even more fortunate because many people have abilities but they don't even know like some people say i have many hidden talents but the problem is they are hidden even from me <laughs> i don't even know so to know that we have abilities is a bigger fortune but to know that our abilities are gifts that is the greatest fortune then we can have ability and humility both so the point is that here the earth is floating because the lord has invested it with special potency so the lord to protect those who are working for him he may sometimes give them extraordinary power and that power is not their power alone of course credit is to be given to them because they are surrendered enough but that power is coming from the lord so we see what is the lord's priority his priority is not to first destroy the demons is to is to protect the devotees if the devo- demons are immediately threatening the devotees the lord will destroy the demons also but his psychology is that he wants to restore the order and empower those who are establishing the order and disempower those who are disrupting the order so uh, now with this mission what does he do that now he has placed the earth te- in a temporary state of security and then the demon is behind that the demon is chastising him he is he thinks i am a great warrior and he thinks why is this this whoever this boar is why is he not fighting with me now, he thinks i am a hero so i want to attack him from behind but i want to goad him to fight so, some people are some people sometimes they are just itching for a fight they're itching for a fight they will keep provoking 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 and then the other person just gets angry and hits so a, a words can also hurt terribly in fact words can hurt longer and harder than arrows because arrows they hurt and that if you remove the arrow the wound gets healed but harsh words they hurt and the memory of those harsh words can linger forever and so here it is said that when when war when lord varaha was chastised by hiranyaksha says where are you going why are you not fighting with me you coward he spoke harsh words and for somebody who's a warrior to have insulting word like to be called a coward is like the ultimate insult so at one level the lord tolerated him so while he was picking up the earth while he was positioning the earth he just tolerated the whole thing because he was for his he was putting first things first let me place the earth securely so and to prabhupada writes in the purport by this the lord is showing he says prabhupada says the lord could have finished off the demon within a few moments by his omnipotence but the lord is showing to the devotees by his actions that while we are going about our duties we should not get disturbed by the harsh words of the demoniac in general we human beings are very social creatures so naturally we are very responsive to how people around us are responding to us so for example if i am speaking and if everybody in the audience starts glaring at me then i start wondering what am i doing wrong am i speaking something wrong and i should be concerned maybe i am speaking something that is offensive so actually our behavior is constantly we could say uh, monitored or yeah it's modified according to the feedback that we get from others and that's a part of healthy socialization that we all in whichever society we are in we, whichever group we are in we need to fit in say for all, for example now all of you are sitting and hearing this talk now every one of you is reasonably confident that the person next to you is not going to turn at you and slap you in the face right <laughs> now hypothetically it's possible but practically it is unlikely to happen 
So we are all here for a particular purpose and we all behave appropriately according to that purpose. So, so basically uh, whenever the point I am making is whenever anybody is displeased with us, whenever anybody is angry with us that causes us discomfort, that causes us distress and the normal human tendency is that if somebody is upset with us, somebody is angry with us, we try to fix that situation. And that's, that's good, we should try to fix. But sometimes situations are just not fixable. Krishna talks about this that Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam Tasyam Jagarti Sanyami Yasyam Jagarti Bhutani Sanisha Pashyatomune. He says that which is night for all living beings is day for the self realized. And that which is day for all living beings is night for the self realized. What that means is that there are certain values which are radically different among materialists and spiritualists. And if we try to earn the appreciation of materialists by adopting their values and giving up our values, then that is what the Bible says, don't, don't sell your soul. Uh, what, what profit is a man if he gains the kingdom, gains the world but loses the soul. So we cannot give up our core values. So there are some things which materialistic people do which we just can't appreciate. Just now, say the Cricket World Cup is going on and I heard this day before yesterday but still I am stunned to hear it. One of my friends in London told me that a person from India came there and he purchased, there is a ticket, there is a cricket, India Pakistan cricket match I think tonight. So he purchased a ticket for 2000 pounds. So 2000 pounds is something like uh, almost 2 lakh Indian rupees. So 2 lakh Indian rupees is enough for a, a poor person in India, they can live for one full year on 2 lakh rupees. So that much people are squandering, what is there in this? So there are, so there are, so there are sometimes some, there will be just irreducible, irreconcilable differences between materialists and spiritualists. The easiest way to make ourselves miserable, now who wants to make themselves miserable? Nobody. But the easiest way to make ourselves miserable is to try to please everyone. We are finite human beings and people are different, we can't please everyone. So if we are trying to practice spiritual life, some materialistic people will inevitably criticize us. And the, and the Lord shows by his actions, Prabhupada says in his purport, don't get disturbed by it. The dogs will bark but the caravan rolls on, the caravan rolls on. Another way of looking at it is I think George Bernard Shaw said that don't, don't ever get into a, don't start wrestling with a swine. Why? Because the swine loves to be in the mud and all that happens is you get dirty. So there are some things which are just not reconciliable. Of course that doesn't mean that we deliberately provoke people or be insensitive to people. There are certain things which are like... Uh, sore spots for people and if we can avoid agitating them, we should. But the, but the Lord tolerates the harsh words that Hiranyaksha is speaking because he wants to show to us that we also need to tolerate. While doing our duties, if people speak harshly to us, just tolerate it and move on. Tolerate it and move on. And then gradually, maybe they will start appreciating what we are doing. So the Lord not only does actions which reveal his omnipotence, but the Lord also does actions which show us how we can function in our situation. So then of course, now it is said in the future verses, the Lord also expresses his anger. So he tolerated for some time, but tolerance is not the supreme virtue. Tolerance is an important virtue, but tolerance also has a purpose. Toler the purpose of tolerance is to keep small things small so that we can focus on the big things. So when Prabhupada, I was trying to build a temple in Jhasi, the League of Devotees and a whole conspiracy came up against him and he was evicted from there, he was told to leave. Prabhupada could have fought a legal battle over there but Prabhupada decided it's not worth it. He said my spiritual master had said you know, open temples in big cities, Jhasi is not a very big city, it's a small city and people are also very more pious than spiritual over here. So let's, let's end it and he walked away from there. But in Juhu, when Prabhupada got a land, and the owner was a double dealing kind of the person. So just now I was in 
America is in California. I met Giriraj Maharaj. Giriraj Maharaj was instructed by Prabhupada to write a book on the whole Juhu project. So just now he has completed. It's a magnificent, uh, several hundred, eight hundred pages book. So as long as Devanarut Maharaj is going to publish it from the Australian BBT over here soon. So Giriraj Maharaj was telling me about. I mean, we were discussing about the book. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada fought and fought over there. Prabhupada said that. You know, this Mr. N will not be able to get the temple even over my dead body. Some people say, you will go over this over my dead body. I will die, but I, only then after you can do it. Prabhupada said, even if I die, you will not be able to get it. So Prabhupada fought. Why did he fight? Because he felt that the, the Jhansi temple, if it is a small thing, forget it. I have bigger things to do in my life. Tolerance means to keep small things small so that you can focus on big things. But the Juhu temple, it was in Mumbai, it was a land which was part of the area of Mumbai that was soon going to develop and become very big, Prabhupada felt we should not lose this land. He was ready to fight for it. So the Lord is now going to turn and fight. So when do we tolerate? When do we fight back? It depends on what is our purpose. If something is a small thing, just keep it small and tolerate it. But if something is a big thing, then we have to fight it. So that's what the Lord is going to do here. So, how do we understand small and big things difference? Say, suppose we are traveling in a train. In India, say we have local trains. Uh, say, it's a, the train coach capacity is 50, but there are 300 people in that coach. Everybody is squeezed together. And every group of people, there are some people who are bullies. So, this, we are standing and a bully is standing next to us. And the bully starts pushing us. And we push back. And they push us. We push back. We think you are so strong, I'll show you how strong I am. We push back, they push back. If we get so caught in pushing each other that our station comes and goes and we are still pushing, that would be foolish. Okay, you are a bully, you want to push? I just move somewhere else. Keep small things small so that we can get to our station and get along with our way. But if that person starts pushing us out of the train itself, then that's a big thing. Then we can't tolerate. Then we have to take a stand and we have to protest, we have to complain, whatever. So, keep small, when we keep the big thing in mind, then we can know what is a small thing and what is a big thing. But if you don't have the big thing in mind, then every small thing can become big. Sometimes people feel that actually there are so many differences in the world. There are racial differences, there are, re there are religious differences, there are linguistic differences, there are gender differences. If all differences were removed, then people could live happily ever after. But suppose miraculously tomorrow Everybody was, everybody woke up with no differences. Everybody was of the same religion, same race, same gender, same nationality. By tomorrow afternoon, we would find 50 new things to fight over. Because these are not the causes of fighting. These are the triggers for fighting. The cause is the prajoguna, the passion within us. The passion and ignorance which make us think small things are very big. So, we need to keep the big things in mind and that is where Krishna Consciousness is very important. Regularly hearing the philosophy of Krishna Consciousness reminds us of what is really important in our lives. That brings me to the last point, which I already started with. How does I'm trying to understand the Lord's mind work in our life? What scripture reveals to us about the Lord's mind? How do we apply it in our lives? So basically, we, our eternal position is that we are servants of the Lord. And we can serve in various ways. Now, uh, so broadly speaking, we can say, we can, serve, we can have service to Krishna by dependence on Krishna and by diligence for Krishna. So this will be my concluding point. What do I mean by those two things? So we normally think of, we should be always surrendered to Krishna. Yes, that's true. And probably we might think surrender to Krishna means like Draupadi. When she was being dishonored, she just raised her hands. Krishna, protect me. That is surrender. But that is one way of surrender. That's dependence on Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita at its end tells Arjuna, surrender. Sarva dharman parityajya mame kam In 1866, he says that. And then Arjuna says, yes, karishe vachnam in 1873 says, I will surrender to you. But how does Arjuna surrender? Does Arjuna raise his hands? No. 1878 describes what has happened. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho 
Arjuna has picked up his bow in readiness to fight. So the way Arjuna surrenders is not by raising his hands, it is by raising his bow. What does raising his bow means? He is exhibiting his surrender by diligence for Krishna. Broadly speaking, in any situation in our life, there are, there are, there are some things which are in our control and some things which are not in our control. So for the things in our control, we need to have diligence for Krishna. Do that thing as well as we can. And for the thing that is not in our control, there is dependence on Krishna. Krishna, you take care of this. About 20, 25 years ago, when I first started giving talks in public, a senior devotee gave me 10 guidelines about how to speak in public. And the last guideline was depend on Krishna. But in bracket, Depend on Krishna, but only after you have prepared. <laughs> if I don't prepare and I say I am dependent on Krishna, that will be a responsibility. So, uh, how, what, what does uh, this mean about the mind of God? See, we understand by our intelligence what is in our control and what is not in our control. And we understand that what is in our control, that capacity to control has also been given to us by Krishna. And what is gone out of a control, that is also by Krishna's will. So, if we have a service attitude, Krishna, for what is in my control, please give me the capacity to do the best that I can. Please give me the strength to serve you. Please give me the strength to be diligent in your service. And for what is not in my control, Krishna, you please take care of that. And this dynamic dance of diligence and dependence is beautifully illustrated in Srila Prabhupada's song which he wrote, Markine Bhagavad Dharma, which he composed on the Boston, uh, uh, on the American shoreline when he saw America for the first time. He says, Na chao, na chao, Prabhu na chao se mate, kashthera putli jatha na chao se mate. So Prabhupada, he describes previously, what is his plan? He says, wherever I go, the way people's heart is going to be purified is by hearing the Bhagavatam, hearing the glories of the Lord. In fact, Prabhupada in that whole song quotes a section from the second chapter of the Bhagavatam. That is the section he describes how hearing regularly about the Lord will purify us. And then Prabhupada, he, so in one sense, he has got a strategy. What is he going to do? He's going to speak about Krishna, Give people an opportunity to hear about Krishna. And that is going to purify, that is going to purify, that is his strategy. But where is he going to implement that strategy? Where will he get a place to stay? Where will he get people to hear? He doesn't know that. So he has, what is in his control is, okay, what strategy I am going to implement? Or how am I going to transform people's heart? But where, whom, I don't know. So Krishna, you take me to people where they will be receptive. Na chao, na chao Prabhu, na chao se mate. So when, if we try to figure out what Krishna's mind is, what Krishna is thinking, it's almost impossible. Because we are finite and Krishna is infinite. What to speak of Krishna being infinite? Even somebody who is finite, if I try to understand what you are thinking, it can become very complicated. So rather than worrying about what Krishna is thinking, we focus on seeing Krishna's will manifesting in our life through looking at what is in our control and what is not in our control. Okay, Krishna has given me this much control right now. Let me use it and be diligent for Krishna. Say we are trying to train someone. And then if they are submissive and receptive, then we can guide them and mold them in a particular way so that they are not that they become our image of how they should be, but rather they become who they are meant to be by Krishna's will. But sometimes when we try to give guidance and people are just not ready to listen, and they start becoming argumentative, and they start becoming uh, resentful, then maybe, you know, we are not, that means the power which we had to guide them, that is now being withdrawn by Krishna. So maybe we just be friendly with them. Chanakya Pandit says this, that, Pancha Varshani Lalayet, Dasha Varshani Tadayet, Prapte to Shodase Varshe, Putram Mitravad Acharit. He says, when the child comes up to the age of five, when they are very small, just pamper them. Now just offer love to them. But between 5 to 15, discipline them. 
because that is the time when they have to learn and after they attain adulthood now beyond the specific ages the principle is once they attain adulthood just be like a friend with them don't try to instruct them when they have grown up so in uh, there's an american author i think mark twain he said that my father was a fool when i was 15 my father was a fool now i am 25 and i am amazed how much the old guy has learned in the last 10 years <laughs> now it is not just that the father has learned but it is more likely that when we come to 25 you know say somebody starts somebody is a teenager at 15 and somebody is about to become a father themselves at 25 then they themselves get maturity and they start appreciating what somebody is telling so like that we all have to work with this dynamic dance of diligence and dependence so we are guiding someone if they are submissive we give them guidance if not okay it's your life i am here as a resource if you want guidance i won't impose myself on you then we have to have dependence we pray to krishna for their for their well being pray to krishna that within their hearts krishna give them guidance so when we understand that krishna's mind is revealed to us through how much control we have and how much control we lose that means krishna is giving us that much kshetra that much area in which to act and if we keep responsibly being diligent for krishna in whatever small area we have if we keep being diligent for krishna then gradually krishna will expand that circle so prabhupad was industriously writing his bhagavatam purports even when he had no idea whether his bhagavatam would even be published Prabhupada was industriously speaking about Krishna uh, to small pe- small groups, two, three people, five people, ten people. But then, because he was doing it industriously, he was diligent for Krishna within whatever area of control he had. And one day, Krishna reciprocated, and not one day, but over a period of times, it happened that then thousands and thousands of people were there to hear from him, and then his circle expanded. and prabhupada was able to do wonderful things in krishna's service so the lord is demonstrating both you know tolerating as well as acting and similarly in our lives for what is can't be changed we just tolerate and depend on krishna and what can be changed we act so both are demonstrated here by the lord and when we learn to uh, da- learn this dynamic dance of dependence and diligence then our devotional service can flourish both internally and externally internally in terms of giving us a connection with krishna that will bring satisfaction and externally in terms of making a contribution in krishna's service which too will enhance our satisfaction so i'll summarize i spoke today on this theme of what how i understanding the mind of god so first point i talked about is everyone is trying to understand the mind of god that the even atheists say stephen hawking said once we understand the equation that defines the world then we would un- understood the mind of god but underlying the scientific attempts to understand the mind of god there is the presumption that the universe is like a machine and it's run by a program by an equation if you just understand that equation everything is understood scriptures tell us that there is a equation but beyond the equation that, that there is a mechanical aspect but beyond that there is a personal aspect also so just like a pilot drive driving a driving a plane so there is the mechanical and the personal both so script so the me- trying to under- we all are tr- even atheists are trying to understand the, the mind of god in the sense that they are trying to understand the nature of reality if we consider god as the great force beyond us which controls things that matter to us then when i do this what will be the result of that we need to understand the nature of reality by which we can act in a way that we can get the results that we desire so uh, what do scriptures tell us about the mind of god i talked about how the lord descends when the disorder becomes excessive minor disorders just like the if small fire the local fire people themselves can take care of it the local fire department can take care of it but a big fire maybe the national fire department will send its own will, will itself come there so like that when this big disruption then the lord himself comes so here there's a big disruption and the earth itself sank because of the indiscriminate extortion of gold from it that indicates how when we interfere with natural ecological balances then what problems will be set off we don't know nature is extremely complicated it's like we fiddle with a 
complicated electronic device and suddenly a fire or electric shock might come up. So, <clears throat> then the Lord gets the earth to, he rescues the earth and gets it to float. What that means is, although the earth cannot normally float on water, but it floats. That means, when the Lord is doing one of his emergency rescue missions, then he can empower those who are a part of that mission to do things far better than what is their normal capacity. So, that is how the, our movement spread enormously during Prabhupada's times, because Krishna empowered those who are serving Prabhupada faithfully. So, to have ability is a gift, to know that we have ability is a greater gift, to know that our ability is a gift is the greatest gift. And <clears throat> understanding this, uh, we can function with ability and humility. So, then I talked about how the Lord turned towards the demon and is now going to fight with him. But before that, he tolerated. So, we also need to recognize that when we practice spiritual life, there will be some values which will be irreducibly different from materialistic people's values. And the easiest way to become miserable is to try to please everyone. We do not want to unnecessarily provoke or alienate materialistic people. But we can't compromise our values, we can't sell our soul to gain the world's approval. So, even if people are displeased, the dogs may bark, but the caravan rolls on. We need to move on. So, the Lord shows that we can, we need to tolerate criticism and move on in doing our service. And then I talk about tolerance is not the supreme virtue. Our purpose, the big thing for us is most important. And we focus on the big thing, then we can keep small things small. But if the big thing itself is being interrupted, then we have to take action. And that brought us to the last point. How do we understand God's, so, uh, God's mind in our lives? We can't figure it out, but we, we can see by God's will how much we have control over and what, we, what control has been taken away from us. So, for what we have control over, we serve with diligence for Krishna, doing the best that we can. And for that which we have no control over, dependence on Krishna. So, when we are trying to guide someone, if they are submissive, receptive, then we try to give them guidance. That means Krishna has given us the power to influence them. But if they have become rebellious and argumentative, then maybe keep a distance. You know, that means we just have to depend on Krishna for their well-being. So, when we understand this dynamic dance of dependence and diligence, Prabhupada manifested that in his song and Prabhupada manifested that in his life. By being diligent with the small area of control that he had, the few people who were interested, by that, Prabhupada expanded, Krishna gave him more and more influence. So similarly, if we try to be diligent in whatever service we are doing, with whatever influence we have right now, then by that diligence along with dependence on about other things for Krishna, what will happen is, we will gain satisfaction internally because there will be a connection with Krishna and we will also get satisfaction externally because we will be able to make a contribution for Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Um, yesterday you mentioned in the seminar about um, when Srila Prabhupada was walking in New York City across the street was this bearded fellow. And we know later on it was High Breaver. Yeah. And they had a, a relationship that was established um, at a distance. But yet, and, and Srila Prabhupada has so much potency was there because he was directly representing his guru David. Yeah. The succession. What if you could briefly mention, um, just expand on, on how you know, everything in Krishna consciousness is based on relationships. I mean, from the gopis and the relations with the Radharani serving Krishna down to us. Okay. And especially we're preaching the mission by Srila Prabhupada. That's what he really wants to do, whatever, whatever our Vana and Ashram is, yeah. is to preach. Because what if you could mention that's true. Expand on how important that, especially in the preaching field, like when we meet somebody out in the street, um, that we have a philosophy we can defeat anybody. But it's important if we defeat somebody that we have to establish, we have to be there to, to help them um, replace their new reality. Instead of just yeah. like Krishna did this past time, That's beautiful. Demon, yeah. But established, then the Dharma, Dharma principles were, were laid That's out. true. That's true. Good point. So, while doing preaching, how important are relationships and how can we maintain or develop those relationships while meeting new people and developing preaching? 
Yes, Prabhupada writes in the nectar of instruction in the purport to the sixfold loving exchanges that the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by these sixfold loving exchanges. It is interesting, Prabhupada does not say that that is also true, Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by our chanting, by our hearing. Yes, chanting and hearing, but it is in the mood of loving reciprocation. So, if we consider even many of Prabhupada's disciples, what are the most memorable moments of their life? It is some sweet interactions with Prabhupada. It is a loving reciprocation. Chaitanya Charita Amrita is such a sweet book because it is filled with loving reciprocations. This Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actively preached for six years when he was traveling across all of India from the age of 24 to 30. After those last 18 years, what he did was sit at one place and invite his disciples to come and he had very touching, moving, transforming reciprocations with Rupa Goswami, with Raghunath Das Goswami, with Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. And by that, he became imprinted forever in the hearts of those who would carry his legacy forward. So, relationships are extremely important. That's what is going to, uh, that's what our tradition shows. And also in today's world, if you see, most people who come to spiritual path, now there, are, there are four kinds of people who come to Krishna. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed and those who are distressed. <laughs> Even if somebody is in need of money, today they will not come to God, they will go to a bank for money, isn't it? It is only when they have some kind of uh, unbearable, unmanageable distress that they start looking for spirituality. And one of the major causes of distress in today's world is loneliness, is alienation is uh, people want a sense of belonging and community and that will come through relationships. So, it is it's both from our traditions perspective, six-fold exchanges are important and from today's need perspective, people ex come to spirituality not so much for spirituality as for community. Hmm? And if they get a sense of community, they stay and they adopt spirituality like additional thing. Most of us when we come to a temple, now we come of course to behold the deities, but we also come to meet the devotees. Isn't it? If, if there is a devotee who we know is there and the devotee treats us coldly, then we may have darshan, but that darshan will not uplift us as much as the devotee treating us coldly will agitate us. Because Krishna's love is manifested through those who are here right now. In fact, and uh, we may say, I am not pure enough to manifest Krishna's love. That is true. But somehow we have been chosen. It is the, the Krishna's mission was furthered by the previous Acharyas in the previous generations. And in this generation, taking forward Krishna's mission is our responsibility. The previous Acharyas cannot act in this generation. Of course, they can act, but they act through the people in this generation only. So, all that we talk about Krishna's love and the devotee's love, that has to manifest at some level at least through us. That is how people are going to experience that love. And with respect to preaching, I feel that for most people, philosophy is not a very important thing which either gets them to Krishna or takes them away from Krishna. It is just one thing among many other things. It is um, say, uh, somebody is Somebody says, okay, you know, everything is one. We might say this person is a Mayavadi. This person is an impersonalist. And further, you know, if you want to go here, you are a demon to believe in Mayavad. But you know, when even if somebody says everything is one, I what does it mean? They might have just heard something somewhere. They might have experienced something. So basically, uh, most people live in the modes of passion and ignorance. And if anything gives them a little experience of goodness, they think that is wonderful and that is their conception of spirituality for them. So maybe they chanted some Om or they closed their eyes and envisioned that everything, everything was one and they felt good because of that. And that is their conception of spirituality. And as compared to what they have experienced in the sensual world, that was much better. Because Gusatva is better than Rajas and Tamas. Even Brahma Shunya is in many ways much more peaceful than Rajas and Tamas in the mode of passion and ignorance. So basically, say, imagine if somebody is very cold and 
the only thing they have to protect from their cold is a thin torn tattered cloth and they have wrapped it completely around them and they're shivering and if we come and tell hey, this cloth it's torn it's tattered it's you they just throw it away i'll give you a better cloth i'll give you a nice thick comforter now if if that is the only cloth they have and if not only we say throw it away we start pulling it away from them this is torn useless they'll fight with their life for it to hold on to it because that is the only thing they have which is protecting them from cold at that point so instead of trying to take away that cloth or telling them to throw away that cloth just put the comforter around them and when they see how comfortable that comforter is then they themselves say i don't need this torn cloth then push it away so they cast it away so similarly so that torn tattered cloth is like their present conception of spirituality it might be in any any way it might it might seem to crazy for us there are people who do laughter therapy you know there's a laughter retreat in india people pay something like 50000 rupees or more to go for one day and do nothing but laugh all day <laughs> and you know you so you say you just laugh and then you cry and you laugh and you cry just express your emotions see this is stupid you know i can tell you a joke you will laugh i'll give you a slap you will slap you will cry what is the big deal but no it's not that simple for them that itself is like something very uplifting as compared to their daily life and if we dismiss that it's like ripping away their thin tattered cloth so instead of bothering with what their present conception is just focus on giving them an experience of krishna maybe through kirtan maybe through some prasad maybe through some just explaining our philosophy in a non confrontational way let them let make this make sense so if they get the comforter around them then they will themselves accept it so relationships is where we offer the warmth of krishna bhakti see there is a light of krishna bhakti and there is a warmth of krishna bhakti as preachers we often focus mostly on giving them the light you are in darkness i am going to give you the light but people don't die of darkness people die of cold so similarly people's hearts people's spiritual inclinations they may not grow in the darkness but they will not die because of the darkness the soul is there and they'll take it up some but it can die because of coldness because of cold so if we if we try to think that our purpose of interacting with someone is to prove to them that they are fools and i am right or i mean so i am not right my tradition is right my acharyas are right no our purpose should be to give people resources and reasons for raising their consciousness resources and reasons for raising their consciousness you know you are living at this consciousness life at a higher consciousness is better this is what higher consciousness means this is how you can raise your consciousness try it out and if we provide it to them many many people are very receptive for it now many times those who are very successful preachers they say that you know i made so many people into devotees now of course we didn't make krishna made through us but still we say krishna made through me not to anyone else i made so many people into devotees you know we may keep a count of how many people came to krishna because of us but how many of us have a count of how many people went away from krishna because of us you know maybe because of our judgmentality because of our fanaticism maybe because of our insensitive speech so we all at least i can think of many many people who in my early days the, the zeal of the new convert you know i was trying just trying to impose philosophy on everyone so it alienates i recently met a friend of school friend college friend of mine in chicago so both he and i were working in the same company we were in the same college and then we were working in the same company so when I, we had to about one hour commute to the company and while we were going to that company i would usually chant or i would read something or i'd hear something and not talk with anyone so then my, this friend was in the same bus and one day he made the mistake of asking what are you doing and then the next one hour i gave him like a concentrated 
dose of the science of self realization <laughs> everything from you are not the body or the soul how the devatas are not supreme krishna is supreme the spiritual world is the real world is material world is the place of misery and actually i was congratulating myself for how well i condense everything in one hour <laughs> and then by the end you know his eyes were reeling but i was so, such a self congratulatory mode i didn't notice it also but then what happened after so usually i would get into that bus first and his stop was two stops later and then he would get in so whenever after that the bus would come you know he would come into the bus peek in and see where i am sitting and then he would come from the other door <laughs> 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 so after that nobody made the mistake mistake in double quotes of asking me what i am doing <laughs> so then i met him in chicago and then we had a nice laugh and i, I remember that incident so uh, i i told him i should not have come off like that so imposing on you he said that's fine so his sister has become a devotee now and he's also become favorable so i would say that he is if he becomes a devotee it's not because of me it's in spite of me <laughs> so it's very important that we see our interaction with others not as making people believe or do what we are doing but as an opportunity to give them some resource for raising krishna raising their consciousness and that's what krishna also does vimrishyate asheshina yatheshyate tata kuru deliberate and do as you desire krishna says in 1863 so if we see, if people take to krishna consciousness that is wonderful if they don't take if they at least feel oh i met a nice person not nice in a sentimental sense but nice man in a culture gentlemanly a wise sense prabhupad was asked once you know who are your followers how do we know your followers prabhupad did not say the chant 16 rounds prabhupad said they are perfect gentlemen perfect ladies and gentlemen that means that they are well behaved because people what are what are they going to see what they can they can't know what's in our heart they can only see our behavior if they feel that we are cultured people then that will attract them so it's very important that we see uh, interacting with people not so much as indoctrinating them in any way but as just developing a relationship with them by which they will become more open to receive the resources by which they can raise themselves raise their consciousness okay thank you for the question i hope the answers Namaste. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhu Pad ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki, Tai Gaur Premanandi.